on this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast. I kill with a bow or with a rifle. They kill with a fork and knife. They have the same responsibility. The non-hunter would think seeing death is so bad for you. In my experience, the kids who grew up around that are some of the most grounded and well-balanced people. It's always gonna be about the killing to anybody else that's not a hunter. But the worst thing is the hunters do not have a developed vocabulary to go out and explain to other people what they are doing. And it also poses the biggest opportunity for us. That next generations just coming into the age of voting and just coming into the age of holding office and if we don't have them on board the idea of hunting being illegal is a very significant step in the human story i don't think that it's, it's really that complicated we just have to open up the bridge between what is on the plate and the fact that it had a pulse and a life before it ended up there episode 79 of the wild fed podcast Protecting the Future of Hunting with Danny Christensen is brought to you by Sir Thrival. Sir Thrival is a nutritional supplement company developed by me to deal with the health issues that emerge from our modern lifestyle. Whether it's invigorating your immune system, igniting your hormone systems, restoring your digestion, raising your vitamin D levels, or helping you supercharge your metabolism, Sir Thrival can help you reach your health goals with wholesome, nature-based supplementation. Sir Thrival carries premium plant, fungi, and animal-based supplements like medicinal mushrooms, colostrum, and elk antler formulas, pine pollen tinctures, and more. Head over to SirThrival.com to check out the entire lineup. Do you feel called to hunting as a rite of passage? There are so many new or potential hunters who want to develop intimate relationships with wild animals in the landscape, but who aren't drawn to the commercialization of so much of modern hunting culture. That's where sacredhunting.com and its founder, Monsell Denton, come in. Monsell provides a space for new hunters to learn to hunt, stalk, harvest, and field dress animals in conjunction with indigenous-style ceremonies that introduce you to hunting in a more intentional and spiritually connected way. Monsell and his team will guide you through beginner hunts or more advanced hunters will find unique opportunities available across the country and globe, like Axis deer hunts on Molokai in Hawaii and even a northern Siberia hunt with the Nenets people coming up in 2022. There are only a few spaces available per hunt, so go to sacredhunting.com and complete their two-minute application. Discounts are available when you let them know you heard about them on the Wild Fed podcast. Again, go to sacredhunting.com and fill out the application. And you can learn more about Monsell and Sacred Hunting on episode 59 of the Wild Fed podcast. I'm Daniel Vitalis, and you're listening to the Wild Fed podcast, a show about reconnecting with nature through hunting, fishing, foraging, and food. Wild Fed. Food is all around you. My guest today is Danny Christensen, a.k.a. the Urban Huntsman. He's originally from Denmark, launched the Urban Huntsman Project while living in New York City, and is now residing in Italy. I initially thought we'd spend most of this interview talking about his brand and living a hunting lifestyle while still being in the city. But to my surprise, we spent more time talking about the future of hunting, and in particular, what it's like to be a hunter in Europe. I find this conversation fascinating, not just because of the cultural differences between North American and European hunting, but because it highlights how things could change here in North America if we don't participate in and protect the incredible North American conservation model. But just how we do that is maybe even more important, because these days everything is PR and politics, and hunting is no exception. Working as a photographer in the fashion industry, a world not known for its high hunting participation, and having European sensibilities, Danny has some great insights in how we forge relationships and develop allies in the non-hunting world. So today, Danny shares his perspectives and experience, which begin in Scandinavia, ranges to the eastern seaboard of the United States, and eventually lands him in Italy, three places with dramatically different hunting systems. This interview made me feel so much gratitude for what we have here and renewed my sense of purpose and mission to protect it because this is something we just can't let ourselves lose. So let's take his advice to heart and make sure hunting survives in perpetuity. We owe it to ourselves and even more so to the generations still to come. Danny Christensen, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Daniel. Pleasure to be here. 
It's been awesome checking out your work and uh, your website, uh, Urban Huntsman. Very cool, man. I'd love to hear a little bit of backstory about uh, who you are and you know how that project came to be. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate the love. Um, <laughs> how the project came to be? Well, I, I, um, I grew up in Denmark you know, on, a, on a little farm there, um, a little, what we call a hobby farm, uh, which is basically a, a, a farm that we don't live off of. My, my parents were um, um, in different businesses and, uh, and um, we didn't, the, the farm was just for pure enjoyment and for kind of an introduction of, uh, to uh, the circle of life to specifically to my sister and I. So um, raising, raising animals, uh, having a big garden, uh, having, uh, you know, having chickens running around and geese and ducks and to, to goats and, and, and some cows that was then slaughtered and, and put on the table afterwards. So I think that was the, uh, the kind of the, the starting point for, for the journey that I've been on ever since and the, the life that I chose to, to live and pursue. Um, look, fast forward, uh, I ended up in New York City in 2001, um, moving from, uh, from Denmark at that point. And, um, and I arrived on September 8th, uh no sorry september 10th so oh, the wow. day before <laughs> so that was a interesting uh interesting you welcome moved to new york city on september 10th 2001 yep i i oh, literally arrived goodness. in the afternoon and oh, and got up the next the uh, next morning and turned on uh, howard stern and uh, oh, heard man. the whole thing live and then went outside and and heard wow. everything so yeah wow. so uh, that was quite a welcome um i uh, i've been hunting ever since i was 14 to jump back to a chronological order here um so in denmark you're allowed to hunt when you're so when you're 16 you can take the license when you're 15 and you can uh probably calculate that there's a little discrepancy in uh, with a couple of years there but um i felt that i was a free soul and, and this was something that i should be able to do when i was a little <laughs> bit younger so um including driving in my parents car sorry my dog going crazy <laughs> in the background here um so basic basically i've been hunting and the hunting and, and fishing for um for the majority of my life and that's been a, a driving force and and, and uh, kind of like a, a, a reason for decision making in in many different areas of my, of my life so um i got to new york city in in 2001 as i mentioned i'm a, I'm a photographer by trade um background in advertising but i shifted over to photography and um I think I found a, I found a trade that I really enjoyed and liked the storytelling and uh, I was intrigued about the fashion industry a lot, which I worked in for, you know, for, for a good 15 years. Um, but there was always something missing. And I think the um, being in New York City is obviously, as, as you know, I'm, I'm assuming that you've been there, but any of the other li <laughs> listeners uh, that were with yeah, any of the listeners that ever visited New York can attest to um, a tremendous amount of energy and a tremendous amount of attraction in the city, but also uh, on a, on the flip side, a, a constant kind of like sensory overload. And mm -hmm. and um, although there's a you know there's small uh, green spots in the city, there's certainly no wild nature, and there's no there's no place at least for for somebody that is used to to being out in nature and having that as a sort of a I don't know a, a sort of a balance to the to the rest of whatever is going on in life. Um, uh, being in New York City obviously uh, poses a few challenges. So, um, can I ask you though, I, about before? Um, there's a couple things here I want to pick apart. One is, and I'm sure you you get asked about this a lot. Is there's an obvious. Um, kind of paradox there, a fashion photographer who hunts, you know, that's obviously a little bit of an iconoclastic. So I want to talk about that. But first, could you tell us a little bit about hunting culture in Denmark? Because, uh, you know, such a different place from New York. I've, I haven't been over there much, but I did give some public 
talks in Denmark around Copenhagen and stuff. And mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. it's a completely different world. So what's hunting culture for, Very for all the North Americans listening? Yeah. What's it like there? And what do you hunt there? Well, uh, first of all, the, the, the biggest difference, I think, is obviously the, it's the way that the, the system works. So in the U.S., you have uh, public land and private lands. And unless um, it differs from, from state to state, but unless private land is posted, you are allowed to actually hunt on private land and public land. Um, that is not the case in Denmark. In Denmark, it is all private land or state land and it is uh, either the owner's right or whoever he leases the right to those are the only people that can hunt on the land so that in itself makes a, a very different system and a very different um, kind of a uh, there's some access challenges that we have in Denmark that we don't have in the United States and I think those you know, moving to the states um, and and experiencing the the public land system and the way that um, that it's uh, used that is really for the people. It it uh, it's incredible. Um, so um, so for for me that was that is the biggest fundamental challenge. But the hunting itself, in many ways, is is similar to what we do in the U.S. Um, um, it, uh, you can have small leases where it's a, a, a group of a few hunters that basically lease a, a piece of land and they do it for the camaraderie and they do it for the time out in, in nature and passing along some, some traditions and, and um, you know, uh, more than anything, putting some food on the table um, as a part of that lifestyle that is, you know, for many people kind of uh, fading out uh, now that we have moving in towards, uh, towards the city and urbanization is kind of uh, the predominant kind of movement. Um, so w- what do we hunt? Well, we hunt pretty much um, everything that's on the European continent. Uh, we have, uh, we have uh, red deer, we have roe deer, which you're not familiar with in the, in the States. Uh, red deer is, is very in the famili- uh, familiar. Uh, it's like the red uh, stag. Yeah, the red stag. Yeah, exactly. They're in the family of elk, um, so very, very similar in many ways. Um, we have a, a sitka, sitka, sitka deer, okay. which is an imported species, and we we have that in the states. A couple of uh, different areas where they've been brought in and then have expanded out. I think um, I think down by Delaware is actually an area where they have a, a pretty substantial um, population at this time. Uh, but other than that, we have the regular, we have hares and rabbits and pheasants and ducks and geese. And uh, um, now we're starting to get some wild boar that, that's been pulling oh, in from, back, yeah. yeah, they're coming back in from the south and with it, uh, um, sharply following is, uh, is the gray wolf that are now being, uh, oh, wow. Introduced back into the to the landscape again. Okay, Obviously, so there's, there's like no a rewilding season. of the landscape happening there. there. Yeah, there is. There is. And interestingly, yeah. when you know, when I think about boars here in the U.S., you know, we think of them as this awful nuisance problem uh, because of their mm-hmm. non-native status. But in Europe, they are a native animal to the landscape. So there must be a different kind of culture around them. I would assume than here in the states. Yeah, but I mean, I think you nailed it on the head. It, it's um, it's considered a, a former, at least in Denmark, a former native species that were uh, driven to extinction, and and uh, now they're they're walking back across the border. But um, you know, there's a there's a big battle going on because agriculture. Um, there's uh, one of the um, the biggest exports in Denmark is uh, pork. So um, with the wild boar comes the swine flu, uh, the potential risk of the swine flu. And when you have 20% of your GDP uh, in boar, uh, in, uh, in uh, pork export, um, it's, quite a, it's quite a big challenge uh, if we were to get hit by a swine flu and had to knock down the entire um, breathing population of, of right, pigs. And, right. uh, <laughs> so... Um, there's a there's a very mixed um, kind of uh, welcome to the boars that are now crossing okay. the border, and it, it actually ended up being the the former government uh, that was there four years ago, um, 
they um, they ended up putting a fence um, uh, along the border of the Danish German border, a boar fence. Uh, no um, way. Oh, and you can imagine how many uh, how many um, interesting conversations and then questions sure. raised and jokes raised. Uh, Comparing a our southern border with the U.S. Uh, building <laughs> the U.S. southern Build wall. wall and, uh, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, another question I have for you, and I guess I have this. Uh, I've never hunted in Europe, so I have this mm-hmm. sort of mental stereotype. I want to check in with you about and see if there's anything to it. I am uh, when you think of hunting in the United States, particularly. You know, you lived in New York, so you know if you're in Manhattan you know, your average person's not involved in hunting. And if you ask them about mm-hmm. hunting, they're going to picture that sort of redneck, lower uh, economic tier, you know, poor country folk who are doing it. And then when I picture, you know, which is obviously not true, but it's a stereotype and it there right. is a lot of it. So when right. I picture European hunting, though, I picture this more gentlemanly uh kind of elitist thing because it's a landowner rights like you were talking about and therefore i would Mm -hmm. imagine that it's the wealthier folks who do it and therefore you know i picture those like fox hunts on horseback and stuff like that you know yeah but is is there is there a different perception of hunters in europe that you've experienced than there is to hunters in the united states as, as far as how the local population imagines it yeah there definitely is um that said, uh, it varies tremendously because in the northern uh, Scandinavian countries, um, also Germany and, and, and France to some extent, um, it, is, it is a very different um, demographic that goes hunting, but the demographic is at the same time extremely mixed. Um, it is not an elitist sport, but it is also at the same time considered uh, a sport uh, that is now uh, preceding golf as the most, uh, you know, the sport where the most uh, um, deals are made and where the most important handshakes are the, are, are done. Okay. Um, you know, so it, so there's this like two sides to it because it is the people that live in the land, uh, in and off the land that are the primary group of hunters still. Um, but obviously, when you take a country like Denmark, that's 5.5 million people in Denmark. I don't know how many farmers there are, but you know, very few today because all the all the small farms have been bought up by the larger farms, and and you know, the uh, we still have an an, uh, an incline in in the hunting population in Scandinavia, um, including in Denmark. So it's growing, you know, it's you it, it's growing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's growing. So, um, so the demographic is is very varied. Uh, even though, it, in, to some extent, it is, uh, you know, if you look at the statistics, uh, it is also an elitist sport. But it will quite frequently be be completely mixed. So it is really a, a, a different perception. Um, you have blue color, but you also have all the white colors uh, that are, um, you know, <laughs> that are all about the latest gear. I mean, we, I think we, like we as hunters, all of us, more or less, you know, the vast majority of hunters are a little bit, uh, a little bit horny for any kind of new gear or Guilty. anything, a new knife <laughs> or a new yeah. something. Even though what we have is working quite fine and. You know, we I think we many times look at them. We we spend our money on on gear instead of actually uh, spending our money on opening up opportunities to. to go yeah, it would be so much better so. spent on experiences, right? And I think yes, sometimes yes, that's what we yeah. we buy gear as a surrogate for the actual experience. And and it's funny looking back. I have this story I tell sometimes. A buddy of mine made a make stone arrow tips, and he was in an archery shop. And, uh, you know, some guys in the archery shop were looking at this stone arrowhead and saying, you think this thing would kill a deer? And we, we always laugh about it. It's like, yeah, man, they killed that killed deer for millions of years. Uh, we've improved stuff that didn't need that much improving. <laughs> we just like, yeah. improving stuff. But then so you end up yeah. over in New York City. And then how um, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you perceived as somebody coming from Europe, how you perceived American hunting when you got here. Um, Cause I'm, you know, I'm so steeped in the North American tradition that, mm-hmm. you know, it'd be cool to get your outside perspective. Yeah. Um, I was, uh, I was in the U S a couple of years before then in, um, in 98 and 99. So that was my first 
kind of an introduction to hunting, and that was down in uh, in Florida. Um, I was in Miami at that time, and so the hunting there is obviously uh, quite different, as you can <laughs> as you can imagine from from my European experience. Um, uh, I did. I basically only went out for boar hunting in in um, in Florida back then. But my real introduction into uh, hunting and the hunting lifestyle really happened when I got to to New York and I got introduced to um, actually my my realtor that I bought the house from had a, had a new boyfriend and this boyfriend was a hunter and uh, so the introduction was was made and really got introduced to to upstate New York up in the Catskills and um, and so basically the hunting that we focused on at the beginning there was uh, that he focused a lot on was, was for white tail deer the, uh, the only uh, huntable deer species in New York and um, and that was a totally different experience than anything I have done before um, both in the ways that they were hunted the terrain and um, and also the the means of hunting uh, you know it's um, he was very much or is very much a, a bow hunter so I was introduced oh, okay. to bow hunting at that point uh, which I never done before and and since since that introduction I think it's been you know it's my primary it's my primary focus I think it's just as such an intense and, and humbling experience to be bow hunting. That, um, Is it true that many of the European countries don't allow bow hunting anymore? Yeah, yeah, it is. And there's a, there's a lot of the European countries that are now debating whether or not they should, uh, they should ban it again. Some of them allowed it for a while, and then, uh, and then now they're debating whether or not they should completely ban it. And that is a what, discussion. What is the that's... argument? The key argument is that it is not an instant kill. You know, the um, the, uh, the idea of uh, an animal being hit by an arrow, even a good hit, um, I, I think anybody that bow hunted that can attest to this, that, you know, the animals don't uh, perish right away. I mean, they you have a, a 10 seconds or something like that where they are still... Um, they're still alive and before they, they perish even with a good shot with a hard shot mm -hmm. um, yeah. so I you know it's a, it's something that I'm it's a conversation and it's a complex um, kind of thought process that I'm battling all the time that I'm going through my head all the time because it, at one on one side it feels like the most pure and the most fair and the most uh, a real and humbling experience in the hunting world that I've ever experienced. But at the same time, it is going through my head that if I would have put a, a well-placed rifle bullet through the heart, um, mm -hmm. most likely they, it will have fallen over right at that instant and would have died. Uh, so if I think it's a super complex conversation and uh, it's, it's one that's uh, very hard to counter argue for the people that are against bow hunting because right. it's something it's that i though, see as a real it's strange because here in the u.s where we have so much firearms freedoms you know with our second mm -hmm. amendment and guns are so common yet if you ask the average non-hunter they will say that bow hunting is more ethical because there's such a, a growing anti-firearm sentiment in the U.S. So it's just mm -hmm. so strange to me that the opposite mm -hmm. rings true overseas. And then the same, you know, with here in the U.S., like I hunt with suppressed rifles and the idea of a silencer here right. is like scares so much of the public. Right. Whereas right. as I understand it, in much of European countries, it's considered just sort of more genteel to have your gun quieted down. Uh, but here it's considered yeah, like okay. a, an assassination, you know? And so <laughs> it's funny how these different opinions, because, you know, so many people just imagine bow hunting to be a gentler, quieter, more ethical experience for everyone. Um, and I always find that strange given that it does take longer for an animal to die and that there's more that can go mm -hmm. wrong. But um, mm -hmm. anyway, I just appreciate that that conversation's happening. Although it seems strange to me that the ancestral method for taking game would be illegal, you know? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think the um, you know it, I can primarily speak for for Italy now. In, in Denmark, there's something else going on right now. I can 
talks on that right after. But here in Italy, for example, in my the region where I live, there's 20 regions in Italy. The region where I live, Emilia Romana, bow hunting is not legal. My neighboring region, Lombardia, which also includes um, you know where Milan is and many of the larger um, cities in the north. Uh, Bow hunting is legal, but then it's legal for certain species and not for other species, etc. Uh, which okay. is something that's similar to to a, um, kind of like a trial period that's going on in Denmark at this point, uh, where uh, bow hunting right now at this moment is legal for all deer species. There is a requirement for uh, the error weight, the total error weight, and then requirement for um the error head specifically oh, okay. yeah yeah and the draw weight of, of course also okay. that's the last one um so those parameters are being tested out and then right now they had a test period i think it's last two years two or three years they've been um, you know both hunting it's been open to all deer species including the red stack which is our largest deer species and you know think of an elk about that size um, and it's up for review right now uh, whether or not they're going to continue it, uh, allow it, allow for for continuous hunting for specifically for the bit stack, but also uh, for the sit cat, for example. Which but is for, also for, for clarity on this, though, the argument is not from biologists saying something like, hey, too many animals are wounded but survive. The argument is simply about ethics of how long it takes to die. Uh, no, it's mixed. It's a it's a it's a mixed argument. Uh, there's definitely okay. biologists that that are, that are saying that um, you know we we need to be able to take those in certain in certain ways. And they're talking a lot about some of the uh, you know this within city limits. Um, we have an explosion in the population of roe deer in, in Denmark over the last uh, 30, 40 years. So we have a tremendous amount of, of deer within city limits and. It's, it's clear, even with the suppressor on the rifle, it's uh, it's disturbing and not to to say uh, potentially um, um, dangerous to right. to shoot with a rifle within city limits. So bow hunting is, of course, the, the natural answer to that. And, and they're having the same kind of conversations in different parts of Europe, um, specifically also here in Italy with some of the cities like Rome, for example, is uh, as uh, you know, obviously a city that uh, I think everybody in the world knows about, but they're having uh, tremendous problems with wild boar entering in city, within city limits and uh, raking havoc on uh, <laughs> on uh, dumpsters, on landscapes, on gardens, and uh, you know colliding with cars, etc. So, um, so the argue the argument is primarily an ethical one based on the amount of time that the animal takes to perish, and then one of the you know the accuracy the efficiency of of the bow kill versus a, a rifle kill. okay so so here you are back in, you're in new york and you're getting exposed to the american hunting world and from what i can tell just looking over your social media and your website you got able you had the experience of of hunting quite a few different species in the states right i saw you on black bear yeah. hunts for uh, instance and mm -hmm. um so getting to do some of that spear fishing down in florida it looks like and um, mm -hmm. getting to kind of do quite a bit of stuff in the U.S. I'm curious what, uh, you know, anything you want to share about that. And also, I guess, to say a little bit more about your brand, too, because uh, mm -hmm. at Urban Huntsman, you you know, it's mm -hmm. a field to table kind of experience that you're sharing through, you know, video and photography and stories that you write. But um, mm -hmm. I'm curious, you know, about your experience here and then and what caused you to leave and head over to Italy, because it seems to me if I was Boy, with an interest in hunting, it's hard for me to imagine leaving North America. <laughs> my, my perception is so many species, so many hunting rights, and such such an easy hunting experience here. I imagine Europe to be a much more complicated place to um, practice you know, the hunt. We'll get right back to the show in a moment. But first, this episode of the Wild Fed Podcast is brought to you by the Salmon Sisters of Alaska. 
I had a great time interviewing Emma and Claire, aka the Salmon Sisters, for episode 51 of this podcast called Made of Salmon. These ladies grew up homesteading in Alaska where they still live and work commercial fishing for salmon, halibut, and Pacific cod. If you love wild food and want to sample or fill your freezer with wild-caught Alaskan salmon, head over to aksalmonsisters.com where the coupon code WILDFED gets you 20% off your first order of wild fish. Check out their Wild Alaska Coho Salmon Box for vacuum-sealed serving size portions or their Wild Alaskan Sockeye Salmon Box for full fillets that'll feed your family or fill your freezer. They've got a smoked sockeye box with ready-to-eat smoked salmon in pouches and their smoked salmon tins, which are ready to eat. Also, check out their beautiful cookbook, their super cool women's clothing line, and their own custom line of printed Extra Tough brand boots. Head over to aksalmonsisters.com to check out their store and use the coupon code WILDFED to get 20% off your first order of Wild Alaskan Fish. Now, back to the show. A life as a fashion photographer is a glamorous of uh, full of <laughs> beauty in many ways. And there's certainly a tremendous amount of perks to being in that industry. Uh, that said, um, as I mentioned earlier, when you're in a city like New York City, uh, the majority of the time you need to figure out if, if you're an outdoors person and if you, if you use um, the outdoors and nature as a sort of a a balance um, in your life. It, it is uh, tremendously hard to be locked in a city where you can just, there's no way of, of disconnecting or finding your own space. And there's very few trees and there's the only wild animals lives on the, on the corner between the second and third Avenue. And so uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it becomes a little bit of a, of a challenge. So, um, at the beginning of my fashion career, I did most of my work out on locations, but then there was a shift in the fashion industry, the way that it, it was constructed and the way that um, 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 the, the business and the work was uh, produced, um, meaning that the majority of the work, of my work at the beginning was maybe 75% out on locations, and that being maybe New York City, but it could also be out in Montauk, or it could be a beach, so it could be in a far off this destination. Um, so I got that travel and the exploration kind of covered through work, but um, but then this, started to, this change started happening, and, uh, and uh, before I left New York, probably 75% of my work was in the studio. So I had to find a way where I could actually get out and, and um, justify uh, putting a, a lot of time into that, being in nature and doing the things that I really uh, was passionate about rather than being in there and, and doing my work. So I figured um, I had to come up with a project that, that could allow me to do that. Um, but it, it basically sprang on. Everything started during conversations that I had within my industry, within the fashion world, within photography in general. Um, many times, you know, uh, you, you're talking to people and they're asking who you are and, and what you do, and you start bringing up these conversations. Uh, and, and it's, it's, a, it's a natural uh, response uh, that, that hunting and fishing will be uh, brought up at, at the forefront of, of who I am. Um, uh, in the U.S., you're very, um, you know, you ask me, uh, what do you do? That's the first question. But um, but uh, in many other parts of the world, um, they ask you who you are. So I think I had a tendency to answer with who I am rather than what do I do, because I don't really think that what I do defines who I am. So right. um, that naturally led to hunting and fishing and uh, <laughs> a lot of very interesting conversations, as you can imagine, and tables, uh, dinner tables with the, with the, the fashion industry around and uh, many of them uh, being far away from any natural connections or having people <laughs> in their, their circle of friends that are hunters or farmers, for that sake, uh, you know. So... Um, what I found was my experience was that there was a there was a broad acceptance and understanding and appreciation of the way that I was thinking, the way that I was talking about it, and there was almost a longing 
for exploration in that direction for hunting and fishing and a simpler life and pulling the you know your vegetables out of your own garden with the dirt on your hands so these conversations kind of opened up a uh, it's i don't know a, a foundation for a concept that would end up being the urban huntsman project uh, which is basically opening up the eyes and ears of people that are not necessarily exposed to this lifestyle and showing them what it actually is from from my point of view and also how accessible and possible it is to make these decisions about going to the South Point or down to Battery Park in Manhattan and fish for striped bass and then go home and, and cook them. Or taking, <laughs> uh, you know, taking the subway taking the subway out to the air, very end for 45 minutes and then walking from there into public land where you can go hunting. You can take a fucking right. subway or you can take a boat with you on your subway, on the subway and actually go hunting at the end station. <laughs> you know, it, uh, it blows your mind. And, and I think I, was, I, was, yeah. I felt trapped so many years in New York City because I did not know that that existed. The opportunity right. existed. And I felt helpless because there was nobody else around me. Nobody introduced me to this environment. Nobody um, taught me or showed me what to do or how to do it. Uh, despite me, you know, spending hours and hours and hours on uh, on Google and trying to figure out how the hell I could get out of the city and I could actually go start hunting and fishing again. Um, so that was kind of how the, the project started, that I wanted to show... Uh, the people around me that there's a possibility for you to have a balance for having one, you know, one foot in uh, in the the urban uh, city landscape, uh, even in a bit in a city like Manhattan, and and 15 or 20 minutes later being somewhere where you can stand and fish and catch your own dinner, or you can take a, you can take subway 45 minutes out and and you can go boat hunting. Right. Um, You're, I noticed you you use a tagline, uh, something like uh, the hunt for silence and a good meal. And yeah, so I was yeah, wondering if that's what you that <laughs> silence part was about getting out of the urban environment and finding that kind of peace of mind that's not really available. Yeah, that, that, that's that's exactly what it is. I mean, it's okay. a it's a sensory constant sensory overload when you're in the in the city, no matter where you go. And I think. Uh, I think, you know, fundamentally, if you take a look at our evolution as human beings, uh, we haven't lived in this confinement as we're living in now for a fraction of our, of our evolution. There's something very fundamentally uh, necessary for us as human beings, like connecting with the land, to uh, connecting with nature and being a part of it rather than and you're kind of extracted from it and, and being a, a product of, of urban landscapes where these fundamental uh, basic needs and connections don't happen. You know, there's a lot of other things that are good about the city. So absolutely, I, I'm, I'm not against cities per, per se, but um, I do feel that they're not feeding uh, our, our ancestral human soul. And, and I think that that's something that is being lost, and we can talk about animal welfare at the same time. You know, that's one of the reasons why I want to talk a lot about food in, in the project was because you know, I get a lot of counter arguments or arguments against hunting being it being in, inhumane. And and uh, the only thing I can say is that 95% of the world's population are carnivores, and you don't get a more uh, environmentally uh, appropriate meal than a piece of wild game. You don't get a a um, a, a meal or a piece of meat that is harvested in a more uh, sustainable way. And the animal welfare. Well, think about it. Uh, a, a pig that's raised in a factory farm ver versus a wild boar that runs outside. The amount of pain and suffering in comparison to a, a pig that's farmed and, and deprived from any natural environment and natural um, uh, ways of, 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 of being and, and abiding themselves by their, by their nature is com completely stripped 
and then versus a wild boar that's walking outside. Even if you take the argument of a bow, if you shoot a bow and you have an animal that is uh, essentially alive, we know that it's pumped up with adrenaline when it's get, it gets hit by an arrow. Or so essentially, we are on, of the understanding that they don't really, they don't feel the pain. Um, but even if you argue that the, an animal lives 10 seconds after it gets hit by an arrow, what is that in comparison to a farm raised or a, at least a factory farm raised where we get the majority of the meat in the entire world? You know, so that argument, it, it's a, you're, you very, very quickly disarm any anti hunting um, uh, point of view with a, a couple of just opening facts. You know, mm-hmm. it's it, it just, we don't, the majority of the people just don't think about it. And for me, part of the project was really to make them think about it. And I know I'm a, I'm a little bit on the fence about um, what to show and what not to show. Um, I wanted to ask, I wanted to ask you about that because I noticed, you know, well, one thing that's obvious about your brand is that your background in photography and in fashion means that the brand has a really strong aesthetic. So it's very nice to look at your media because it it's quite polished looking and has a real good feel to it, a nice tone. Mm-hmm. Um, but also it seems like there was a recurring theme in your writing about this thing you're talking about, like, like, Hey, this might be hard to look at, but you kind of should because you're already participating in it, you know? So exactly. It's, Exactly. And I think that, that that is something that's ongoing now. And it's, it's something that is really uh, publicly being raised now with, uh, and it's a debate within the hunting community about what do we actually show? What is our role on social media, for example? Um, which is, of course, a fucking crackpot because what, what, what should we show and what should we not show? I totally agree that there's certainly things that we should not show and there wouldn't be a need to show it and uh, at least if there is it seems to be the, of the wrong reasons um but at the same time for me it's essential for example that i show in these stories that i produce uh which by the way this project was born hand in hand with a food magazine so i went i did not want to talk to i did not want to talk to the hunters I wanted to talk to non-hunters, and I wanted food to be the catalyst for this conversation. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was essential for me to actually show that, show that a dead animal looks this way. <laughs> Breaking down a dead animal looks this way. There is a, a tremendous amount of our thoughts and emotions that are being put into this. And every single person that picks up a fork and knife should have the same consideration before they dive into that state. You know, they, mm-hmm. they have the same responsibility. I kill with a bow or with a rifle. They kill with a fork and knife. Yeah, so yeah. It's, essential, it's essential for me to actually open up their eyes and say, listen, you have the same responsibility that I have. Whether I go to the supermarket and I go out and harvest it, we have the same responsibility to ensure that this animal here was treated as humane as absolutely possible and that we are actually putting uh, those values before ourselves so we don't go down and buy the factory uh, farmed uh, uh, chicken, but we actually buy an organic chicken that is free-ranging. You know, So it's the same considerations that we have. We have that responsibilities as as consumers and but the the link to that the link and the understanding of that is completely stripped away when when you don't see the animal when you don't make that connection when it's just when it's just a piece of protein with a different shape and a different color in a cooler at the supermarket we do not make that connection it is the uh, the vast majority. They go in, take a look at the price, and that's it. You know, quality yeah, maybe for second. Um, so, well, I've noticed with kids who grew up uh, hunting, fishing, or on a farm where they've seen animals slaughtered for food. You know, the the non hunter would think this is bad for a person. Like, oh, seeing death is so bad for you. Turns out, in my experience, the kids who grew up around that are some of the most grounded and well balanced people because they have a, um, their vision and view of death is very balanced. 
because they understand that it's part of the life cycle. And it seems to me that the more you keep somebody from seeing that, the more mentally sort of ill they become until they're living in a kind of fantasy land. And then what we do is we just keep covering their eyes. There's so many things like I'm thinking about, we all know that our, our phones and our computers, you know, that they're made in sweatshops, but we never see what that actually looks like. So it's easy to keep participating, right? Because we never see it. And there's so many things like that, you know, human trafficking. We know that it's going on. We don't ever really see it. And so those things that are can take place in the dark, that's where the worst of humanity festers, like when there's no light shown on the thing. And so to me, show there it's hard. I get what you're saying because doing hunting media myself, you know, and being on TV now, there's stuff that I want to show that we're just not allowed to. And I think personally, it would be good for people to see, um, but we're not allowed to. And I, and I understand, I get the both sides of it, but I mm-hmm. think people need to get real again about what things are, you know, to see it. Again. I, and it's not just animals. I mean, how many people know what a fully grown lettuce plant looks like? Most people who eat lettuce every day of their life never even seen, you know, right. a lettuce plant gone to seed. So it's like people are operating right. in a, kind of an illusory world. Right. And, and I think about before that, I totally agree with everything you're saying. I think for the bigger picture, um, the people that are against hunting, for example, let's just take the vegetarians. Vegetarians, I think if I weren't a, if I weren't a hunter, if I wasn't a hunter, I would be a vegetarian. Yeah, you know, I, I think there's a there, ten years. I can't get that. Yeah. Okay, but, but yeah. it's it's literally if I if I were to compare myself to any other segment of any other group, it would be the vegans because we care about the same thing. We care about animal welfare. We care about the environment. We care about a sustainable future. We have so many common things. And I, I choose to eat meat, so I choose to hunt it myself or at least be sure that whatever I buy at supermarkets when I have to are the pieces that are uh, ensuring that these animals have the best possible life before they're harvested. But make no, I mean, uh, there's no doubt every single plate, or if you're a vegetarian, or if you're a meat eater, anywhere in the world has blood on it. And that, mm-hmm. that is the bigger picture people need to understand. You know, the, if you were a vegetarian and your primary food source comes from soy, Soy in Brazil is the main uh, reason for deharvestation of the Amazon. They plant soy fields, you know. So it's it's like, do we do we raise this question? Do you understand what that means? Do you understand how many species that probably uh, have now been forever extinct because you eat soy? You know, yeah, it's, it's, worse. it's not it's worse. <laughs> it's worse. So you have to, you know. That, that bigger picture where we pull back and where we really understand how the ecology of food production works is right. something that we are not seeing. And mm-hmm. at least from, from my part, I wanted to open up the eyes at least for consuming, you know, consuming meat and, and what that means and let people see that this thing on your plate, this piece of, of protein that is laid out really beautifully and that tastes amazing, it actually had a heartbeat. And it's my responsibility, one, to end that heartbeat, or if I do it with my fork and knife, or if I do it with my bow. And at the same time, it's my responsibility that I ensure that they live the best possible life before they ended up um, on my plate. Wow. So I really yeah, wanted really- to open up for people, open up people's perspective on, on what that means and have them in, infuse some responsibility in in their choices it's it's really cool what you just said about kind of like having more in common with the vegans than almost anybody else in the sense that both parties have these really strong beliefs and then make tremendous lifestyle changes in in order to um, not compromise their ethical position and uh, that's like Mm -hmm. a really cool bridge that can bind to what appear apparently like very different world views that are actually quite yeah. quite similar so mm-hmm. yeah that's mm-hmm. really cool you know kind of getting back to what i was saying before about the united states and our our hunting freedom here i wanted to ask you a bit about what it's been like in italy because i'm uh i'm concerned that we may be getting a little complacent here in the united states about what <laughs> we've had and starting to take it for granted and with such tremendous changes taking place 
yeah, I'd be curious to hear what it's like to be a hunter, particularly somebody who hunts for meat. Uh, what's it like over there? Uh, where to begin, where to begin. It's complex. It's complex and it's a bit alarming. It's, it's quite alarming, to be honest with you. So there is a, a huge difference in the general perception and acceptance of hunting uh, from the northern Europe to uh, central and southern Europe. Um, it is kind of perplexing in many ways, but the northern countries have a really high acceptance rate of, of hunting as a part of our culture and uh, as a part of, of the future. Whereas you, if you go to the southern part of Europe, which counts Italy and France, Spain, um, there's really a growing opposition to hunting. And here in Italy, we are faced now with uh, really tough challenges. Um, before we talk about Italy, let me just try and sum something up here uh, that can kind of put some perspective on it. In Europe for 2021, uh, generally known anti-hunting organizations has a budget of 27 million euros to push uh, anti-hunting and non-hunting. Hunting organizations have about 1.2 million oh. to push the opposite oh. agenda or to broaden the perspective and to broaden the understanding and appreciation of hunting. So we, there's two problems. There's the monetary problem that you can buy your way out of anything. So if you have 27 versus one, um, you can buy yourself enough media coverage and hire a really good PR agencies to speak your case and you win. Secondly, the majority of the people that are engaged in the anti-hunting organizations are people of a younger generation. So we lost a younger, the understanding from a younger generation. They are also the same generations who are very media savvy. Yeah. And the hunters are of an older generation that are not media savvy. So, you know, many, the majority of the hunters, they take an ostrich approach. They stick their head in the sand whenever uh, they get out somewhere and they don't say that they're hunters or they don't have the developed vocabulary to actually explain what it is. You know, we, we can't shy away from uh, from the hunters primarily being uh, elderly white men. The biggest uh, hunting segments of hunting groups, hunters groups, uh, both in uh, North America but also in Europe, are the baby boomers. You know, they're not born into technology and they're going to disappear within the next five to ten years statistically. So about anywhere from 35% from, uh, to 45% of the hunting population worldwide, or at least in North America and in Europe, will disappear within the next five to 10 years. So what does that mean? What does that mean when we are actually talking about political support, when we all of a sudden don't have these voters that are actually, that actually puts their, uh, their little uh, um, cross off uh, by a candidate that supports hunting? What does that mean? That means that the hunting now in five to 10 years become so politically hot topic that nobody's going to want to touch it. Nobody's going to want to support it. Mm -hmm. Unless, you, unless this whole thing turns around and we get the younger generation, uh, generations, uh, generation C and the millennials are uh, really engaged in this industry and they're in the cities. The majority of them are gravitating towards the cities where there's education and job opportunities. It seems to me that the that the hook for those generations is the food piece, because uh, there's going to be a growing opposition to the idea of 3D printed food, you know, and everything coming out of mm -hmm. boxes and packages. And, and I think that there is going to be this interest and resurgence that we are seeing a bit of in, like a food yeah. renaissance. And, I, and my hope yeah, is absolutely. that you know, websites like yours and mine are are inroads for those folks. But I wanted to ask you, going back to what you said before about the difference between Northern and Southern Europe, I would assume that when we're talking about, you know, Sweden, Finland, Norway, Denmark, who, who, if I understand it, um, is the sort of crown of, of Greenland as well. Um, these are countries all have, you know, Arctic 
or Arctic bordering areas. So is it because, you know, sort of the equivalent of maybe what Alaska or the Yukon is to Canada and the States, is it because there's a more of a wilderness component and therefore people are a little bit closer to the land as you go further north that it's still accepted and that it's more urbanized as you go south? Um, is that kind of what, mm. what the separation is or is it something else? No, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. There might be a, there might be some to that, but I really don't think that that is, um, the problem. The problem is a communication or lack of communication. Um, the problem is that we have a very strong hunting organizations in the Northern European countries, oh, okay. or, organizations that are implementing um uh, uh, teachings about uh, ecology about conservation about hunting about food uh in public schools taking pheasants into public schools as as an example for my for my own country um i was recently introduced to a project there um that is basically aiming at young kids from from kindergarten and up to you know the ninth grade um, and they're in public schools creating this uh, information kit about hunting and taking the classes out, bringing pheasants into schools and talking about it. And the you know the national television is there covering the whole thing. And then they have a talk with the chef uh, on national television. They clean the pheasants together with the. You know, with the kids, and then they cook it with together with a, a chef, and then everything is broadcast and talked about. So, you know, it, it's a, it's a conversation that we can have. You know, there's so many things that we can't talk about in today's world. You know, we can't uh, we can't say any profanities because uh, it's gonna put put us uh, put us in hell, and we can't we can't see a naked breast on TV because. Yeah, I don't know why, because maybe some biblical relates. I don't know, but it's just so, you know, it's so complex. We shine away for so many things that we can't, that we can't see, that we can't talk about. Political, taboo. that's a, not taboos that are, are in political correctness. And, you know, yeah. so yeah, I think we have, yeah, we have, a, we have an openness in the northern countries that we don't have in the south. Okay. There is an openness to talk about everything, to show everything, to have a debate about everything, and more than anything, to laugh and crack jokes and and be sarcastic about pretty much every single thing that we have. You know, yeah, there's that open here in the U.S. so fast. Yes. It's like there's no yes, there's no there's no air left in the room. There's no humor left, and and the no, things that we no. used to laugh about in order to kind of heal ourselves a little bit of these tensions. Now it's too taboo mm -hmm. to even laugh anymore. Yeah, too taboo. We are just so scared shitless that somebody is going to be right. angry at what we're saying and get right. offended and sue right. us, or you know, it, it's it's just it's a. Way, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Block us on social media, and God forbid that we should lose a follower. You know, so <laughs> no, that's. But I think that's the primary reason why there is such a difference between the between the north and south that we just have a traditionally a very different uh, cultural structure um, in the ways of, of both how the society is structured. You know, we have a, a strong belief in in equal rights in Northern Europe. Uh, and that if you go to Southern Europe, including uh, Italy here, I think many women that actually moved to Italy or Spain or uh, or Southern France or any of this Greece or some some of those countries, you know, you they have a culture shock. And the worst thing for them is really that sexism that they're exposed to. So it talks a little bit about the advancement of the way of thinking, um, and and that is just a, a kind of an old mentality in the in the southern part of of Europe. So I think that's the primary reason. What what does it take to get involved in hunting in Southern Europe, particularly in Italy? And, and are there a lot of roadblocks that you wouldn't experience in a place like North America? Yeah, absolutely. Um, in, in general, I, I would say I can speak to um, an Italian citizen that is born and raised here had to take a hunting license. And a hunting license is very complex. There's nothing that is simple, straightforward, or a kind of linear uh, process in, in Italy, nor in France or in Spain, for that sake. Um, so it's extremely complex. Uh, it takes a long time 
and it's a huge commitment to do it. Which I think, to some extent, um, the U.S. could could learn something from a little um, a little more education. I think that will be beneficial, and I think it will be beneficial for many different reasons. Uh, for the hunter, for the hunter, him or herself, and secondly, also for the way that we are able to communicate about it. Um, yeah, yeah. Because when when you have a broad understanding of ecology and how uh, an animal's life is structured and put together and what they live off, and when you have a more in-depth understanding of the way to talk about the experience and the animal hunted and how that how that feeds into a cycle of life and where where we kind of fit in there as as hunters, how we take part in this uh, kind of a, a natural cycle that's been going on for millions of, of years. Um, so in in Italy, for example, you have to take this long test, and there's a written test. There is a, a practical test, uh, which basically means that you have to walk through terrain with a gun, and you have to obey by the laws. So you have to uh, break open your gun when you pass any ditch or fence, or take the shells out, look through the barrel uh, when you have, before you put the shells back in again, things like that. Um, but in Italy specifically, you have to, you take one hunting license and then you take a permit and the permit allows you to hunt for different species and spe specifically ungulates, which is uh, ungulates. Uh, so, uh, anything with a hook. So that being wild boar, that being a uh, deer species or that being mouflon or whatever it might be. So, um, that is a separate permit and it's basically going through a totally different license process and you have to take that uh, before you can go out and hunt these animals and I I understand that there's certain different curric curriculum for for a general hunting license and then for these species but um, for me for example I thought I came here I just last year uh, I've been here for two and a half years now uh, I started here three years ago um, it's just the last year, so two years into it, that I finally got my Italian hunting license. Because English is not a recognized language here, so unless you speak fluently uh, Italian, you cannot go in and take that test. Uh, even oh, no. if you speak fluent, even if you speak fluently Italian, uh, the uh, I would guess that probably twenty five percent of that test, you have no idea what it says. You know, it, it's it's <laughs> legal term, so uh, it's it's pretty much completely impossible. So for my, for in my case, last year was the last season, the season we just ended, uh, was the first season that I was allowed to go out and hunt for small game. I still don't have my big game license. Oh my goodness. Oh that my is, goodness. that and is are three you heavily years. Restricted and you must be also quite, and I know you're, you were in the, uh, Florida and in New York. So you have very different gun laws, for instance, in those two states. Yes. It's one of the weird things about the U.S. is you have places that are so restrictive and places that are almost completely unrestricted. Uh, but I imagine in Europe that the weapons are much more regulated as well. Or, you know, is yeah, it, is yeah it absolutely. Is no. things like that? Yeah, there's a, there's a, there's a big difference. Um, they're more restricted. Hunting... <laughs> Hunting weapons are categorized. You can't go out and hunt with an AR-15 here. Uh, you can only use that on certain land, on you know shooting ranges. Um, but uh, in general, there is, for example, in Italy, if I go out and buy anything for that has more than one pellet or one bullet, I need to register all my ammo purchases, every single one. I need to go to oh the police goodness, and really? register every single. So you basically you buy a yeah. cartridge, uh, you buy a, a box of twenty shell, a bit twenty rifle uh, shells, um, and you you have to go register uh, that case at the local uh, police. Wow! Um, and it goes for twenty two. It goes for twenty two. So if, for um, twenty two long rifle for small. For twenty two like long that, rifle, no? uh, yeah, it, uh, it's the same wow. thing. Wow! Same thing. So <laughs> oh, man. Wow. But I think that speaks, you know, it speaks more to to Italy's uh, general system here, just being yeah. completely ridiculous in many ways, uh, just so outdated um, and frustrating. 
I must say that. <laughs> um, but um, in general, the gun laws in Europe are, are very different than they are in the States. They are much more restricted. Um, it's not impossible to get guns here, though. Uh, use, uh, as long as they're for hunting, you know, and you have a hunter valid hunting license, you can yeah. you can get the guns that you need. Uh, but there's more hurdles um, in certain parts of the European Union. There's now um, new systems being implemented in that uh, makes it a lot easier, not less secure, but just a lot easier. So uh, everything is being basically being done digitally in Denmark, for example. They are rolling that out now that uh, that you can apply everything digitally and uh, and the uh, Basically, cuts down the, the time, the processing time, with a you know fifty percent or so. Could I ask you to look into your crystal ball a little bit about the future? And I, and I want to ask you about three places. Um, I'm curious, you know, about Southern Europe, Northern Europe, and the U.S. Where do you picture this headed in the next couple of decades? Do you see hunting actually lost in any of those places? Do you think um, in Northern Europe and in North America that it will become more restrictive? Or do you think that there's a, having been involved in the industry now a little bit, do you think there's a renaissance in any of these places that will keep it freer? Um, but where do you mm-hmm. see it all headed and, and what, what, it, what kind of future do you see for hunting, you know, in the civilized world, so-called civilized world? Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's a good question. It, it, it's one that I'm, <laughs> I'm debating daily and thinking about daily. Um, I see a lot of warning signs, um, signs within our industry that gives me reason to uh, of concern. Uh, signs in in general that gives me reasons of concern. Um, I think there is a, a whole bunch of hunters that are tone deaf, uh, completely tone deaf, and think that this hunting that they're doing now is a right. Uh, which is not, it's a privilege, and that is a fundamental shift that needs to happen within the hunting population. And then we need, we need what, some what other... Are those people? Or, like, can you give us an example, you know, obviously not an individual person, but but what does that mm-hmm. look like to you when you see, what kind of stuff do you see that you go, oh man, that's tone deaf? Um, well, an, ar- an argument that, that uh, the hunters are... Um, an elderly hunter that says uh, that he's going to do whatever he wants and go hunting wherever he wants and he's going to walk up to a house that is uh, with kids running around outside and go hunting within 100 yards from it because he's allowed to. You know, that is just uh, asking for it. That is one post on social media of a hunter that's hunting in the backyard with uh, pillows lying over a house uh, with kids playing outside. So that will be an example right. of it. The other example is a is a a, a hunter that thinks that uh, that he can do whatever he wants, and the way that he communicates is of a point of view of a existential right to to go out and hunt and kill when it's it, when it's really not when this um, you know this uh, head head against head kind of battle saying. Uh, you know, against the non-hunters or at least against the general public saying that this is uh, I'm allowed to do whatever I uh, do now or want to do because I've been allowed to do it in the years previous. I've been hunting these areas since the day I was born. Um, so that is completely tone deaf. And the, the other thing is, is what I mentioned before. The worst thing I think is that the, the hunters do not have a developed vocabulary to go out and explain to other people what they are doing. And I think that is that is uh, the worst thing that's going on right now. And it also poses the biggest opportunity for us because I need, I need, we need somebody else to step up. I cannot go out and talk to all the hunters, but there is hunting organizations in Europe. We have a uh, face which is the collective union of uh, hunting unions from all over the European Union. You know, they need to figure out how they go out and actually talk to these hunters. How, how do we take these hunters in Europe, these 50 million now, I don't actually know how many hunters there are in Europe, but these the large group of hunters in Europe, how can we make every single, each one of them an advocate for hunting how could we dress them up to having these conversations, these non-confrontational conversations 
with the general public and being proud instead of sticking the head in the sand or going uh, head against head with somebody that's opposed to it uh, without any, uh, any good argument, how can we dress them up to actually having these conversations? How can we develop their vocabulary? How can we develop the Ten Commandments of hunters? You know, what does that say? How do we communicate this? And um, the, the other challenge that we have in, in general is that many, uh, uh, the majority of hunters are, again, uh, we are males. You know, how many females are there? The females can talk to softer values. They're allowed to talk about the softer values that we associate with hunting. That's a very big part of hunting. But us as hunters, as male hunters, we are not allowed to talk about this. You know, we restrain, restrict ourselves. We cannot, I cannot, uh, you know, comfortably go out and say this is, you know, when, when I took this last deer, I had a flashback of um, the people I lost and I cried and I was super grateful for this. And, you know, we, we don't have these conversations. We don't allow ourselves. It's so masculine driven. And I think that's a huge challenge within the industry. But if we can shift that around, if we can have some leaders that can come in, and this has to be organizations. For example, you know, uh, the American Fish and Wildlife, when they're actually giving out these hunting licenses, there should be like a book, an ethical book, talk about hunting. How would that look? How's the Ten Commandments look? What do you say? What do you say when somebody ans answers that? And they are allowing for these hunters to assign some softer values to it because before, before we can do that, it's always going to be about the killing to anybody else that's not a hunter. It's always going to be about the killing. Yeah. Yeah, these are really good and important points. And, and um, I, I sort of did interrupt you with that question because I was asking you about your vision of how this is going to look in the future. So I want to come back to that, but I just really want to second what you said, that there are all of these um, emotional components to hunting that... I think some of us are just starting to talk about more openly um, because those things sort of soften the heart when you realize that somebody's not a sociopath or a psychopath who exactly. hunts, but that they yeah. that they're having a, an emotional connection to what they're doing. Um, so, and I really do think you're right that you know I took a trapper safety in uh, Maine a couple of years ago, and there was you know it was like a three day long course with a significant amount of stuff about communicating to the public about trapping because trapping has such mm -hmm. a negative image here mm -hmm. in the US but when i took hunter safety there was almost none of that a very yeah. very little comparatively so i really agree that i think there could be more done on the education side here in the US but but yeah looking at world events do you see everywhere else heading towards what you see in places like italy or do you think that there's a chance we could really keep it in perpetuity in North America and in the Northern European tier countries? I, I don't know. I see the opposition growing, growing, and I see the, the hunting population um, uh, and the industry related. I want to really emphasize that. I think there we have, uh, we have a lot of big players within the hunting industry producers of guns, producers of other equipment associated with hunting uh, that are not doing anything at all. The only thing, their primary, primary goal is to drive sales. But mm -hmm. if they cannot open their eyes and see what's right in front of them, what's going to happen if they don't start investing into the communication of hunting, the communication of the lifestyle, and understanding of our general uh, role and place in this uh, natural environment and in the cycle. I think if nobody does that, if nobody puts their dollars or euros towards that, I think we have lost. I honestly don't think that we can pick it up fast enough in order to remedy the damage that's already been done and and uh, flip the turn the scale again. So I'm. Honestly, look, I'm, I'm fearing that you're going to see us a, a ban of hunting part uh, starting out in southern Europe and then continuing to spread out. Um, I'm hoping that at least some countries, at least my own home country of Denmark and Scandinavia, has such an integrated uh, understanding and, and developed uh, acceptance of hunting and what hunting really is, that they will... Uh, maintain um, and it was it will 
continue to be a part of our future history, but I'm fearing that it's not going to go that way. I'm fearing that we're going to see a, a kind of a wave of uh, a domino effect from the southern part of Italy because in Italy also, you know, there are so many different hunting organizations. That's one that's the federal federal hunting organization. But by the time that they figure out that bureaucracy and what one person is against and actually come up with a plan, it's too late. Mm-hmm. I have no doubt that it's too late. Unless somebody, industry leaders, industry companies are coming in and actually putting some dollars and money behind driving this and doing it right and and um, and basically putting their money where they are spent best, understanding who can communicate this best, not talking to the general hunting population, but talking to the general population. I think that's yeah. always been a huge challenge because uh, when I started the Urban Huntsman Project, I didn't go to a hunting magazine to produce these stories together with them, which would have been a lot easier, a lot easier to get somebody to to dive into a project like this. I went to a food magazine because I wanted to speak to the general public. I don't, you know, I don't need to preach to to the to the people in the church. I need to preach to all the rest outside. That is where I'm going to make any difference. So, um, in regards to the U.S., I I don't know. I, I'm seeing, you know, I'm seeing that, that I have a lot of friends within. And my world of, of fashion and communication, et cetera, that are seeking this change, that are seeking a, a friend of mine, vegetarian like you for, for many, many, many years, and now reached out to me and said, listen, can I talk to you? Because I have decided that I want to explore hunting because I think it's a natural progression for me. You know, so there's there's those people that are, uh, in the urban environments that are um, educated and better at communicating, which we need. Uh, but then at the same time, I just know on the outgoing back end, I know how many people we're going to lose uh, within a very short period of time. And if if we don't if we don't increase the amount of hunters coming in to at least balance out the ones going out. I also fear that politically it'll be super challenging to to keep hunting to keep hunting going in the future. Yeah, you know, that thing you brought up about the boomer generation uh sort of being on their way out, they comprise so much of the only 5% of the US citizenry that hunts and uh they there's this tendency I notice around a lot of hunters, they don't want more hunters because they want more land and more game to themselves. And so they're mm-hmm. content to That's see wrong. the numbers stay small and it's so short sighted, you yeah. know, it's yeah. just, it's it really is. hard for me because it, it's that, that it is that next generation. And incidentally, that next generation is just coming into the age of voting and just coming into the age of holding office and, yeah. you know, starting yeah. to turn the levers and dials of industry and all of that. And if we don't have them on board, you know, and the thing is to me, when I think about it, it's like the idea of, of hunting being illegal is a very significant step in the human story. I mean, mm-hmm. our you know three and a half million year evolution where hunting has been part of it all along, you know, you, you could make an argument that the banning of hunting would be in the top few things that ever happened in history really, yeah, as far as things that changed us. So yeah, man, that's really intense to think about. I guess sort of closing... Um, you brought up food and I kind of just feel like that is the inroad. That's the way I don't think selling it from ancestry perspective or selling it as a, you know, it just seems to me talking about food, talking about, or, you know, healthy beyond organic free range food that you have a hand in seems like how, um, recruitment is going to best work in this future generation. But I want to get your perspective on that part too, because you've brought up education and communication a lot, but what are the specific things you think are most important to be communicating as we go forward? Well, again, I, I completely agree with you. I think, um, I think food is the bridge builder between the hunting and the non hunting community. Um, I have not, I have not had a conversation with, um, anyone, uh, that lasted longer than five minutes. And after those five minutes, I have been able to, uh, gain an understanding and acceptance and even had a desire to know more about hunting and, 
you know that that is uh, that's the way that we de-arm the rest the non-hunters and that's how we gain the understanding um if we go back to the food we have to understand we have to move it away from the killing because in the public eyes um it is about going out and killing something but the same thing you do the same thing every time you drive to the grocery store it's right. the same thing so we have to we have to take the sting out of that we have to disarm it by talking about about food and saying well this is what we're doing i i don't think that is it's really that complicated we just have to open up the the bridge between what is on the plate and um the fact that it had a pulse and a life before it ended up there i think that is the best way that we can open and open a conversation and gain a, a really broad understanding of hunting what what it is and what it in the end amounts to it amounts to a piece of uh, of, of uh, something on the plate so you take a deer uh, uh, versus going in and and buying your chicken you know a, a deer produces 70 maybe 70 chickens or you know 60 chickens is equivalent so you take one deer's life is equivalent to 60 chickens and 60 chickens if you're not buying organic free range they live a terrible life many of them probably brothers and sisters broke their legs and never saw daylight was pumped up with hormones and antibiotics you know it's a it's a hard one but it's a conversation that we actually need to have and i think that we are also in the hunting community very afraid of having is uh, what is this compared to factory farming you know there's a lot of hunters that are farmers and a lot of them have a good heart and, and trying to do the right thing but um it's definitely an argument against the uh, against these 95% of, of carnivores in the world that, uh, you know, I don't know how many of them are buying organic, maybe one or two percent, but that brings you down to 93% are not buying factory farmed meats. You know, that, that conversation, if you just draw a quick parallel into what it means to be a life in a, a chicken farm, a conventional factory chicken farm, Plus, uh, versus what it means to be a free roaming person. And, you know, it, it, it's, it's very apparent to anybody that is uh, engaging in that conversation for 30 seconds that the life of a person is far more well lived and deserves, uh, you know, but both of them deserve the same kind of life, but one doesn't because you're not making the right choices. You know, we, we, we choose to go out and and harvest this organic meat, you choose to go in and actually uh, determine the fate of this chicken that lived its entire life in you know, under stress and captivity and, and pain and suffering. Wow, man, there's, this has been a really <laughs> eye-opening conversation with you. I, I Honestly, a slightly different direction than I imagined. And I'm so glad it was because these are really important and thinking about the future of hunting, there's not a lot of things I care as much about. So uh, no, I'm just very glad we talked about all this. Hey, what's on the future horizon for you and what's going on with your project? And, um, you know, you said you got a small game license there, but still working on the big game. So what, what are you, what are you uh, what's on the what's on the future for you, man? Because I know as a hunter and uh, as somebody who, you know, it's, I know you fish and forage, too. There's uh, always something that we want to be doing. So I'm kind of curious yeah. what you've got coming up next. Well, well, I'm very, I'm very determined to have um, to have my big game license in place by uh, by next season for sure. That's that's the primary goal. But I also um, I'm I'm in the process of buying a little house about a an hour south of here, which is up in the Apennine mountain mountain range, which is the the mountain range that goes all the way through Italy. And um, um, one of the things that we didn't talk about before in, in conjunction with the with the land and the way hunting works is that you can actually set up a, a, a reserve what they call the reserve here in Italy which is basically a piece of land that needs to be over 300 hectares um, and then you can set up a private hunting area um, so cool. the house that I'm buying has land within a preserve that is the largest one in my region and uh, because of all the strange laws here in Italy, when you hunt in a preserve, 
I can actually hunt on my Danish hunting license. I do not need to convert uh, my Danish hunting license to oh, an okay. Italian okay. big game hunting license. So that is kind of like a, a loophole. So hopefully I'll be doing a lot more hunting specifically for wild boar and fallow deer next year. Um, and then I, I'm planning on continuing my work with them. Um, with the Urban Huntsman Project, it's been kind of a, a bit dormant here for for a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm working with um, Modern Huntsman magazine, which I hope everybody already knows about. If not, please please check them out. They're uh, like minded to you and I, the way that we're thinking about hunting and the future of hunting and, and the way that it should and, and should be conducted uh, moving forward. So. Um, looking forward to, to many more collaborations with them. And I hope that I can um, find some sort of an editorial outlet that I can continue, specifically a food related editorial outlet, so I can continue to do some, some of these, these stories and hopefully open up the eyes. I'm trying to figure out how the hell to get out to the general public. You know, we, we can, I don't want to talk to hunters, I do, but I don't. Uh, because I think it's kind of a lost cause to uh, continue to talk to hunters. We need to get out to the to the general public and, and get this uh, that this point of view across and, and open up their eyes to to what hunting really is and what the alternative is and, and how we deserve uh, and, and nature and conservation deserve that we uh, remain as a part of the, the near future. Man, I, I love it. I love that attitude. I'm on the same page. And um, I guess lastly, I want you to know, of course, we're going to put links to your website and your Instagram account and all those kind of things. Um, but I just want to give you the floor to tell people about anything you know you want them to see. Um, definitely your website's a great place for stories for, like I said, also very beautifully done, uh, but also recipes and uh, you know the food components there too. You know, It's a very well-rounded mm-hmm. space. Uh, but yeah, where do you want to send people? What do you want them to check out? If they were going to go check out one thing from you, what do you want to send them to? Well, let's start out with Instagram. I think Instagram is the is the best source, and it links over to my website. So, uh, the the Urban Huntsman uh, is my Instagram handle. So, start there and jump over to the website and see some of the content. Uh, there's a lot of recipes on the website. Uh, it's also just www.theurbanhuntsman.com. Thanks for listening to the Wild Fed Podcast. You can help us grow the show by subscribing and leaving us a rating and review. It ensures better rankings and more advertiser interest, which translates directly into better shows, more awesome guests, and a constant stream of fresh new content. Have a question you'd like answered on the show or a hunting, fishing, or foraging trip you'd like to host us on? Email us at info at wild-fed.com. And be sure to visit our website, wild-fed.com, to check out the Wild Fed video show and store. Wild Fed, food is all around you.